Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. Uh, it's so nice to see such a great room. There is uh, some documents are being uh, given through the room. It's just as reference and I'll be talking about it in one second. So in this presentation, I'll be focusing, unsurprisingly, after you heard the introduction probably, on the market for African art that, and African objects that developed in Europe and the United States during the 1910s and 20s through the lens of one particular case study, which is the collection of John Quinn, it's a collection, um, and more specifically on his African art collection that he assembled between 1915 and 1924, and which was dispersed shortly after his death in 1924. So through this, dispers through this dispersion, the works acquired several additional strata of meanings, uh, showed that not only do objects have social lives, but they actually, these lives are actually non-linear and oscillates between a field developing around the African object as work of art during the 1910s and 20s. Uh, through the impacts and the marketing done by a certain number of dealers, but also back to the ethnographic museum and to the ethnographic uh, uh, concept. So this is what this uh, oscillation will be investigating here. So John Quinn was a prominent lawyer and an art patron in New York uh, who lived between uh, 1970 and 1924. And he started his collection by focusing on books, on uh, paintings by Irish artists especially. He was, Iri he was of Irish descent and really focused on these at first. And then progressively started to be interested in more adventurous artists, especially following his involvement with the 1913 Armory Show e exhibition in New York. Um, he was the lawyer for that specific uh, major e event in the world of modern art and uh, was very involved with the organizing of the Armory Show and following that um, event, he started to collect works by the most modern of artists at the time. Um, he was known for his difficult character and for always negotiating prices very uh, sharply. However, he was also known for paying very good prices for his objects and might have sometimes been taken advantage of. And so we'll be looking at the prices as well that he was paying. Um, he was not collecting as an investment and prided himself in really collecting living artists um, because he thought it was more sporty, as he said in one of his letters. So his modern art collection, just to give you a sense of the importance of that collection, um, among the works that he owned and that were dispersed after his death is Matisse's Blue Nude, which later entered the collection of the Cone Sisters and, it now, and is now at the Baltimore Museum of Art, um, or Douanier Rousseau's Sleeping Gypsy, which is now at MoMA. And this is only two examples out of over 2,000 examples of works by modern artists. He had the largest collection of Brancusi in the United States, uh, and I could name many other very, very famous work that he acquired. Judith Seltzer, uh, the art historian, researched that part of the collection extensively and tried to um, find what his collection actually entailed, because through its dispersion, a lot of the objects actually were um, I wouldn't say lost because they exist, but uh, the identification with John Quinn, the fact that they were in his collection was lost in the process of the dispersion. So she had focused on his modern art collecting and nobody had really looked at his African art collecting until I started looking into this. Um, so yeah, one thing I wanted to say is, uh, I feel I really appreciated uh, Manuel's presentation and I think it's a great, um, it was a great leeway into what I'm going to say. And you, you said in your intro that you were going to talk about how objects became exotic. And part of my presentation is about how objects became almost works of modern art through the framework of uh, the market that was put into place at that moment. So going back to the photograph that I had as the first slide. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken by Charles Sheeler in 1919, the American artist who at the beginning of his career, while he wasn't well known yet, started to work as a photographer for a number of dealers in New York. 
And what you see in this photograph is seven out of uh, about 32 objects of African art that John Quinn purchased, um, as I was saying earlier, between 1915 and 1924. Schiller actually produced an entire album of Quinn's collection in 1919. Uh, and this is something that I have published elsewhere. So the document that's circulating is actually a full list of all the plates by Schiller of that collection, together with the list of prices that Schiller paid, as well as where these objects ended up after the dispersion. So because I don't have time to really get into the detail, I thought that would be nice for people to be able to have a look. Um, so as you... Yes, yeah, so as one can see on the list that is passing through, John Quinn was really buying for a very small group of specialized dealers who were all focusing on the sale of art by European and American artists from the avant-garde. Uh, so these dealers were, I was doing so well. Oh. Okay, uh, one of them is Robert Cody, and this is a view of his gallery in uh, 1914 in New York. This is December 1914, and you see, you know, following the accumulations of the shops that we sh just saw in Manuel's presentation, here um, the works, you know, you have paintings on the wall, and you can recognize works by the Douanier Rousseau on the back wall. Over here, you have uh, Egyptian antiquity. And then here at the front, you have what is um, an element of a uh, reliquary from Gabon, which uh, has become very famous in the corpus of African art, which is here positioned you know, on a pedestal, isolated by itself, and prominently shown as a work of art, you know, similarly to the other works in the gallery. The the following image is uh, a view of the gallery of Alfred Stiglitz, very f famous exhibition, which he organized also in the winter of, 1914, winter of 1914, an exhibition which went by the great title of Statuary in Wood by African Savages, the Root of Modern Art, which tells it all about you know, the situation of uh, that time period, the contradiction between these works being seen as the root of modern art, the beginning of you know, this move, great movement of the avant-garde, uh, and at the same time, still, so the artists who created these objects are still the savages. Um, Stiglitz is actually, uh, this is from this gallery that John Quinn would acquire his first object in 1915, shortly after the closing of this exhibition. Uh, and one also has to think that the exhibition before this one was one focusing on the works of Brancusi. The one after was one on Braque and Picasso. So this show of African objects, which was really the first exhibition entirely dedicated to works from Africa, shown as work of, works of art anywhere in the US and in Europe, uh, was really framed within this context of the development of modernism. And one key individual in this whole story is Marius de Zayas, whom you see here as a great dandy with a fantastic mustache next to two works uh, from Côte d'Ivoire that were on view in the exhibition that I just showed previously in the exhibition in Stiglitz's gallery. And de Zayas was actually not only responsible for channeling objects from Paris to New York uh, for the Stiglitz exhibition from one dealer, which is Paul Guillaume, and we'll be speaking about, I'll be speaking a little bit more about him today, and we'll hear more about it later. Um, so he was not only responsible for Stiglitz's exhibition, but then he opened his own gallery in 1915, and uh, the modern gallery, which later became the Desayas Gallery, and he actually ended up being the main provider uh, of African objects to John Quinn uh, between, yeah, during that entire period. So, in all three galleries, uh, it's really the role of these works as this provocateur of new art forms. That is the impetus for showing them. And uh, the Stiglitz's title that I just mentioned, but also press clippings from the time period show that very clearly. And I can't resist to show you this press clipping. Uh, weird art from darkest Africa, does it explain cubism? Uh, is from 1917, uh, shows objects that were in Desaias' gallery, and the mask that you see. Here we go. 
OK, the mask that you see on the right of the screen is actually one that entered, entered uh, John Quinn's collection in 1917 as well. Uh, and I think he bought it for $270. So as I hinted at rapidly, um, the works shown in these galleries all came through France. Um, and we're basically following the colonial channels and also, you know, to some extent, the trajectories that we just saw through Manuel's uh, presentation as well. It's the same process uh, going from the French and Belgian colonies, like Côte d'Ivoire, and they're marked with little stars on the map, um, Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea, Gabon, the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then going to France and Belgium and from there, moving to the United States. So it's following the colonial channels and then also the same channel as uh, the market for curiosities and ethnographica uh, simultaneously. Um, because the focus of the conference is the Western market for these objects, I'm not entering into where these, how these objects were coming out of Africa. This is a whole other story. I know we'll be also speaking about it a little bit later this afternoon. And I'm also open to answering questions if there are any afterwards. Um, so these objects were arriving to Paris and being often sold in bulk in large quantities. And then were being individualized quite swiftly through the shops of a few dealers in Paris, which we'll be focusing on. Joseph Brummer, Paul Guillaume again, and Charles Vignier. And it's through uh, the use of photography, individualiz individualizing them, uh, you know, taking photograph of each individual object, as uh, Wendy Grossman, among other scholars, have been talking extensively about this, uh, but also through a pricing strategy, uh, marketing, and the clientele that they're trying to target. So Joseph Brummer. Uh, I show this uh, quite revealing example of a couple of transactions that took place in 1912 uh, in Brummer's gallery. So this is a copy of his accounting book. And um, this is, okay, I'm gonna try to, this one. Okay, so you see two um, sales from Joseph Brummer to Sergei Shukin, the very famous Russian collector of works by Matisse and Picasso in July 1912, first on the 13th and then on the 16th. On both occasions, Shukin buys uh, first a group of five Negro sculptures in sculptured wood for 500 francs. And then on the second occasion here, you see one Negro statue in wood of a seated monkey. So we actually know the objects from Shukin collection and we can identify at least which is the seated monkey. What's particularly interesting here, it's two points. One is the difference in prices. So you see that on the 13th, it's, a, it's $500 for five objects, a hundred, oh, sorry, 500 francs for five objects. On the 16th, it's one object for 1,250 francs. So there is already a qualitative aspect that comes into play, which is a little bit hard to understand today um, without exactly knowing which of five objects the other ones are, but we know that collection, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense from today's perspective. Um, and the other really interesting point is that, as you can see, Shukin also buys Picasso's and the Picasso painting of a yellow landscape cubist uh, sells for $1,100, which is actually a little cheaper than the seated monkey, which is actually a Bijogo stature. Um, so also as a point of comparison, on this page we have great information, among others the uh, rent for the shop, which is 771 francs, down here rent for his apartment, which is 142 francs. So it also gives you the range of scale and, you know, this one Bijogo statue really sells for a lot of money. This is not, here we go. Okay, so contrast and back to um, the Ethnographic Museum. This is 1912, so the same year as Brummer's um, transaction with Shukin. And uh, this view shows the, the 
Penn Museum in Philadelphia following the 1912 purchase of over 2,000 works from the Congo from one uh, British ethnographic vendor, W.O. Oldman. And as you see, it's a sharp contrast in display. Here it's about accumulation once again. The works are just placed on the table uh, or shelves. Shields and spears are aligned on the walls like colonial trophies or uh, hunting trophies in uh, other instances that we find in other instances. What is great is that we also have the invoice for this particular purchase. So you can see that in 1912, the University Museum in Philadelphia purchased that group oops, of 2,029 objects, collection of African specimens for 865 pounds. Um, it's a lot of objects. It ends up at, if you divide 865 by the 2,029 objects, you end up at 42 cent per object. I know these are pounds and not francs, and I know we have specialists in the room who could tell us more about the conversion, but it's definitely much less money. Um, and the other interesting point, of course, is not only that it's sold in bulk, but they're also described as specimen. We don't have specific objects detailed. These are you know, a large group of objects uh, that is seen indeterminately. So as such, we really have these two parallel markets, one for ethnographic works and one for works of art with different discourses, um, different vendors' intention, different modes of display once they enter the museum and then different prices. But in the end, they're you know, similar types of objects. Brummer was acquiring a number of his objects from the Ethnographica vendors of London through auction. Uh, it's the same circles and circulation uh, works that end up in these two different places. So a little bit more briefly about Oldman and also Webster, just because I do love this image on the right of uh, Webster, which I believe is right now on view at the Ethnologische Museum in, in uh, here in Berlin. Um, what is uh, great on this photograph is you see Webster standing next to a series of uh, carved tusks from Benin, from the Kingdom of Benin, and not only is he standing there really f uh, surrounded by these trophies, uh, but also you can see little numbers up here next to each of them that show that this was actually probably accompanied by a list of prices. So this is a commercial tool uh, that is used in order to sell these objects. It's a, and similarly in that list from Oldman, which is actually quite close to uh, some of the list that Manuel just showed, showed us uh, previously, a list of prices. You can see that Oldman describes himself as a dealer in weapons and curiosities. Uh, and he published one list like this every month and would send it to all his buyers, potential buyers, all the ethnographic museums that he was uh, in communication with. And so we find a lot of them at uh, UPenn, which is where I found that particular example. So, oops, okay. Um, back to John Quinn, sorry for, it's a long roundabout. Um, so the case of its collections dispersion is really quite revealing because it's a moment when th where these two worlds, the art world and the ethnographic world collided. Uh, John Quinn's death was, uh, did not really happen suddenly. He had been sick for a number of years, but even though he was a lawyer, he didn't really plan for his estate. And he um, left his collection as is. The only work that he planned to give to the Louvre was he owned uh, Seurat's Circus, which ended up at the Louvre indeed after his death. But otherwise, um, the rest was not planned. And there was a heated debate following his death about what would happen to that collection. The great fear was that by trying to sell over 2,000 works of modern art in a field that was just barely coming into shape, the world of, you know, the commercial world for modern art was really as its beginning, the worry was that it would just flood the market entirely and that it wouldn't sell properly. So they decided in the end to do uh, a series of private sales and then two auctions, one in Paris, one in New York. And interestingly, the individual who was put in charge of 
selling the African art collection, the African object art collection, uh, was Joseph Brummer, who comes back into the story. He was actually, he had moved to New York by the end of the 1910s and had become a close friend to John Quinn and became uh, put in charge by his estate of selling that collection. By then, he knows that UPenn is an active buyer. It's actually on the East Coast, one of the most active buyer of African art at that particular time. So Brummer reaches to UPenn and hopes to sell the entire collection to them. So what you see here are lists of all the objects in Quinn's collection with uh, little annotations in the margin by the director and uh, curator about whether these are objects are better or worse than the examples that they already have in their collection and also about the price difference because the thing that cost, uh, shocks them the most are the request the prices. You can see them here and um, sorry this is cut off but the total asked for 36 objects in the collection is over $4,600 which is a large sum of money at the time um, and in the margins, what you see in most places is, and it's hard to read, I apologize for that, but is, we bought something similar for one pound 10 years ago. We bought something similar for, yeah. And they really just do not understand the price difference. And it's really these two worlds of Quinn, you know, buying from modern art dealers, spending significant of amount of money that is being asked by People like Vignet and Paul Guillaume who are really trying to create a market for these objects. And actually I had a quote which I forgot to read earlier and I'll read it now uh, from Paul Guillaume and I hope I'm not stepping on your toes. Um, Guillaume had written to Desaias in 1917. I believe that in America the market will favor classical works at high prices. There one sells. I only want to deal with works that one sells fast and well. One wastes time going against the present. I believe that modern paintings will never make us rich, but it is different for Negro art because they are antiquities. So there is a reframing of the African object as antiquity, and then we can ask for higher prices. Um, yes, so with a lot of back and forth between UPenn's director and the estate, um, UPenn decide to offer them, instead of $4,600, they offer $1,000 for the entire collection. And the estate cannot accept this. They say, John Quinn actually paid between five and $6,000 for that collection, to which UPenn answers, I cannot understand how he paid that money. And so after a lot of back and forth, what they decide, because they really want to acquire part of that collection, is to buy half the collection 18 objects for $1,500. That's kind of the middle ground that they go for. As a result, so you know, from five to six thousand dollars that John Quinn paid, it went down for, to about a little over four thousand, and now it's 1,500 for half the collection. So in the end, it loses. It goes down to about a third of its originally asked value, and the prices paid by Quinn originally. Um, Okay, so they do end up entering in the collection. And interestingly, and I'm going back to this image for one second, um, the, some of the objects that they had so much trouble acquiring ended up leaving the collection afterwards. Some were deaccessioned in the 1950s because I guess they were thought to be duplicates. We were talking about this notion earlier. Um, and then an object like this one, which I showed you earlier, is um, ended up being lent to an exhibition in the 1930s and was stolen while on loan, so we still we do not know where it is today. So what happened to the rest of the collection? 18 enters UPenn, 18 others end up being sent to Chicago uh, with the effort of the, art in, of the Arts Club of Chicago in 1926. And the reason why Chicago wants so badly to show this exhibition, and we see a lot of letters, she's desperate to get this, these works to be shown in Chicago, is because Chicago had become quite an important platform for modern art, and was also uh, an important platform for the African American community that had been moving from the South for the previous decades. New York was one, Chicago was another, and, and so on. And uh, by the middle of the 1920s, the American reception for African art 
started to be cha charged with strong social implications that were in the conjunction with the emergence of the Harlem Renaissance movement, mov movement in the 1920s. Um, and somebody like the philosopher Alain Locke, for example, uh, started talking about African objects as ancestral legacy for the African-American population. So the Arts um, Club of Chicago wanted to engage with the African-American uh, population in Chicago and really wanted to show these African objects in that context. Um, they ended up having, these 18 objects ended up coming, they were only shown for two weeks, so I'm not quite sure what impact they ended up having, uh, but as a result, oops, here it is, um, the Arts Club of Chicago ended up, don't, uh, Okay, can you go back? Thank you. Uh, ended up purchasing five of these objects, five of the 18 objects, to donate them to the Anthropology Museum, the Field Museum in Chicago. So here again, we just keep going back and forth between the art world and then there is this added layer of you know, uh, African-American and ancestral legacy connection and then it goes to the Anthropology Museum. Uh, for the price that the estate was asking for, which is $100 in that particular example. Twin had paid $270 for this one. Uh, one more thing about this particular object, which you see up here at the top of the pile. Uh, we actually know where it was coming from before it arrived uh, in Desaias's gallery in uh, 1919. It was actually in the collection of a colonial officer Belgian called Joseph van der Bogarde, who had, who had this photograph taken in 1916 of his collection, really showing you know, an ensemble of uh, colonial trophies. And this sculpture is standing at the top of the pile next to a number of other works of great importance, some of them which actually ended up in UPenn by some other routes. Um, and it's just such a, such a terrific photograph that tells a lot about these works uh, movements. What was left with this collection, and I am almost done, uh, is then sold at auction. 1927, there is the Queen auction. Uh, there is a section, it's the fifth and last session that is dedicated to works from Egypt, from all sorts of origins, and also the works from Africa. And I want in particular to look at this one, the sculptured wood head, grotesque, grotesque head with curious headdress, the eyes are inset with metal plaques uh, upon an elongated neck, which you see was bought for $300. And this is actually this work, which uh, Quinn had purchased for $600. Uh, from the Zayas as well, and you see on the right, when it was photographed by Schiller, it is still positioned at the top of its reliquary container. So this head would have been placed on top of a reliquary basket and was kind of the public face of ancestral remains. Um, through the years, so already for the Queen auction, the basket is removed, but it still has its eyes. The way you see it on the left, it's how it appears at auction in 2010, where it sold for $330,000 uh, at Sotheby's New York, and where you can see that it does not have its metal eyes anymore, and of course the basket is still gone. So uh, these works really had you know, very long life, and actually this one probably ended up in André de Rhin's co collection during the following years, um, and had yet another history. So I think it is time for me to conclude. Um, one thing that I find particularly interesting in this back and forth and this oscillation, oscill oscillation between uh, the art market and the ethnographic market that they, they just continue to live in you know, parallel lives with the objects just keep going back and forth between the two of them. And I think it's something that is still, it's a system that's still quite, quite relevant to today's questions and struggle with the display and presentation of African art. Um, and so looking at, back at this foundational moment of the creation of this market, the development of this market um, really resonates quite powerfully today. It raises a lot of questions. You know, I didn't talk at all about uh, the questions of the aesthetic qualities of the objects, questions of authenticity that, are that were raised earlier, where these objects are origi originally coming from. Uh, so there is a lot more to be said, and I think I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>